What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. I'm recording this during a graphics card update, so I like to live dangerously. Welcome back to another episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. I really thought I'd have a lot of throw the book at you puns for this, but again, gotta go fast. So today, Secrets of Magic, Sparkling Targe Magus. If you're liking what you're seeing, like, subscribe, ding the bell. Stay caught up on all your stuff. Remember that Patreon is the number one way to help me grow this sweet channel and could get you a bunch of cool rewards up to and including Google Sheets for this build and several other builds for Pathfinder for a second and Starfinder. Huh. Now let's dive in. Okie doke. So now that I'm done making a bunch of throw the book at them puns today, Sparkling Targe is the Magus we're building. Have to say it was really hard to choose exactly which hybrid study we were going to dig into. Really at some point I'm probably going to do all of these, but for now what we're worried about is by taking Sparkling Targe, we gain the shield block general feat. While we arcane cascade with our shield raised, our circumstance bonus to our AC from our shield being raised also applies to saves against spells and other magical effects. I remember in the very early days of the playtest, one of my player's fighters asking me, hey, can I raise my shield versus this reflex save spell? Well, the sparkling targe magus can. And I guess also will saves that's very interesting flavor you raise the shield it raises a mental shield in your head at the same time i don't know in addition damage you take as a result of a spell or magical effect while you're cascading can trigger your shield block reaction even if the damage isn't physical if it's entirely just somebody picking apart your brain you can raise the mental shield as well when you block damage in this way you increase your shield's hardness by an amount equal to the extra damage from arcane cascade which is usually one but sometimes two or three so plus one hardness and also you can block more things and also this works when using a physical shield the shield spell or you know like a book it's conflex spell probably my favorite of all of them shielding strike for one action make a melee strike you can then either raise your shield if you're wielding one or cast shield if you have the spell i watch all the time my champion in one of my 2e games regret not having raised his shield because he tried to make that other attack in this case we can spell strike hit him where it hurts and then like go fishing but also make sure we've protected ourselves there are a lot of really cool arcane spells that make tanks even tankier in first edition pathfinder one of my favorite ways to be the frontline marshal as we all know was scaled fist one paladin two swashbuckler one and then 16 levels of whatever the hell you were actually playing oftentimes that would be something along the lines of a magus so i could blur myself displacement myself mirror image myself stone skin myself so on and so forth that's essentially what we're trying to do here, except there's an archetype that leans into it a little harder, which is really cool in a world where a crit out of nowhere, especially in lower level play, can just delete a character. And since there are a lot of things in house that allow us to buff ourselves, that means we can use our spell list, though it is limited, for other tech things and damage. The goal here is to spread as wide as we can and be like the perfect fifth member of the party. We can hold the line with the champion when we need to. We can hit things, maybe not as well as the rogue. Rogues are scary. I'm going to make a rogue magus at some point and it's going to be gnarly. Then maybe next week. That's probably next week. Next week on Min-Maxing for Fun and Profit, Tommy beats you up with a rogue magus. It'll be tight. And everything in between. For the ancestry today, it's going to be a hobgoblin. We're going to take tiefling for our versatile heritage, kind of sort of because there aren't any first level ancestry feats we're dying for, kind of sort of because nimble hooves is actually really good, mostly because I like the flavor of a hobgoblin who has the power of hell flowing through them. For our background, well, I'm so glad you asked. In Secrets of Magic, a bunch of rare backgrounds got released. And I really like that because that means there are backgrounds that are cool and unique and neat. And I'm not just like, eh, take something that buffs these two stats. Case in point today, Time Traveler. Not only does it boost our intelligence, which is the thing we wanted to boost, we get trained in three lore skills from the old timey wimey things. And we get the bend time action once per day you are quickened only to stride. Is that really good? Yeah. Is that better than most backgrounds? Yeah. Is it game breaking? Probably not. Especially again in low level play where that extra stride to get between like what's an on Sierra monster, the plague wolf and the like wizard on the other side might mean the difference between the wizard's life and death. For our starting ability scores today, we're looking for a strength of 18, dexterity of 10, constitution of 14, intelligence of 16, wisdom and charisma at 
10. Before we dive in, of course, all of my builds from here forward are going to be running the free archetype variant. I should probably make a video about why free archetype is so good. Honestly, content creators of the Paizoverse, I think we should all just put out a video where we're just like stare into our camera, free archetype, let it happen. And we just keep doing that once a week until we've subliminally pushed it into the meta. We can do that, right? That exists. Anywho, class feats out the gate at level two because we don't get a class feat at first. You knew you would see it because I've memed about it a lot. Raise a tome. For one action, you raise up a book you are holding and flip it open to defend yourself and expedite your studies. The book remains raised until the start of your next turn. While you've done this, you have a plus two circumstance bonus to AC and plus one circumstance bonus to recall knowledge to identify creatures using a skill related to the subject of the book. Arcana, if you're using your spell book, probably don't use your spell book because you will be blocking with it and I don't want you to kill your spell book. Whatever you've checked out from the library several towns over so the librarian definitely won't find you and definitely won't find you for a destroyed library book and definitely isn't some kind of outsider, that'll do just fine. That bonus is on top of any item bonus the Encyclopedia of Eldritch Horrors would normally give. If you have shield block, why yes we do. You can use the tome for that feat. The tome has hardness 3, 12 HP, a break threshold of 6, which is a wooden shield. Though probably of less bulk, even better for us. Whenever you use an ability that allows you to raise a shield, such as most of our class feats and our hybrid study, we can raise this book instead, changing any requirements that normally require a shield to apply to that book we've picked up. I really like the flavor of just putting a little bit of magic into a book and so that book stops things. Or just like being that dude flipping through a book and then realizing there's combat and oh god I'm in danger Ray's book book is destroyed at level four we'll take force fang for the force fang conflict spell and an extra focus point in the focus pool force fang literally just being magic missile the strike for one action whatever weapon we're using transforms into a spike of pure force that does 1d4 plus 1 force damage heightened plus 2 for an additional 1d4 plus 1. Since our conflict spells recharge our spell strike having something that just auto hits seems pretty damn good. At level 6 as soon as we qualify shielded tome. During your daily preparations, you can magically fuse a shield into your favorite book where it appears as an elaborate bookmark. I love it. While the two are fused, the book shares the hardness, hit points, and broken threshold of the shield, and it can be used to shield block. We've already been over this. Go the other way around and your shield can have a book shaped motif. It must be in shield form if you want to use like spell guard shield things or whatever other magic shields might be floating around. Really I'm just trying to protect the book and maintain the flavor of knowledge is power and power is apparently used to not die. This feels incredibly late. I value force fang higher than this but only just expansive spell strike next. This feels staple as hell for magi everywhere. Rather than needing to use a spell that has a spell attack role for spell strike, you can use a harmful spell that can target a creature or that has an area of a burst cone or line abiding by other restrictions of the spell strike. When you cast a spell that doesn't have a spell attack roll as part of a spell strike, it works in the following ways. Should you critically fail the strike, the spell is lost with no effect. Creatures use their normal defenses against the spell, so like if you're spell striking burning hands, they get a reflex save. If the spell lets you select a number of targets, it instead targets only the creature you attacked with your strike. But if the spell has an area, the target must be in that area. A burst is centered on a corner of the target square or the square corner closest to the center of the target. In the case of like hitting a huge creature, I guess. In any case, if the target is larger, larger, you choose the corner if more than one is eligible. A cone or line emits from you and must include the target. If you're not adjacent to the target, choose any square adjacent to the target as the source, which is really good if you're like starlet spanning fireball, but that's not us today. The spell affects all creatures in the area as normal, but the strike still targets only one creature. This allows us to become even more versatile, which is so huge for the arcane caster. Gets bigger and bigger and better and better the more downtime you have to jam stuff in your spellbook and the more forewarned you are about what kind of combat you're going into. If you're going to be fighting lots of single big things then you might be just as well off with your single target spells but if it's going to be a bunch of little things burning hands lightning bolt fireball dare i say could see a lot more mileage than your normal spell strikes 
Next up, again, as soon as we qualify for it, Dazzling Block. Whilst we're in Arcade Cascade, my god, that's hard to say. Say that 10 times fast. Arcane Cascade, Arcane Cascade. You can create a flash of brilliant multicolored light in a 15-foot cone. Everybody in the area fort saves with the following effects on a crit success. Well, nothing. On a success, the creature is dazzled for a round. On a failure, the creature is blinded for a round and then dazzled for a minute. The creature can spend an interact action rubbing its eyes to end the blinded condition, after which it's still dazzled for the rest of its life, presumably. And on a critical failure, the creature is blinded for a round without the ability to rub its eyes and then dazzled for an hour. Dazzled is pretty huge. If vision is your only precise sense, all creatures and objects are concealed from you which means it takes a DC 5 flat check to hit you, which is to speak in money terms, a 20% mischance. So this is either they can no longer swing because they've lost their eyes, or at least swing accurately, or they have a 20% mischance to continue on, probably for the combat without a once per day tag, without costing a focus point. Now, some creatures will get around this, sure, but a lot of the field is just donezo when this hits them. Really makes up for the fact that we have less spell slots than a lot of casters are used to, so we don't necessarily in high level play need to worry about blurring ourselves, we'll just let the shield do it. Next up, we'll take Cascading Ray for one action. If our last action was a successful spell strike and the spell we cast dealt energy damage, we let a ray of energy fire out within 60 feet from the creature we damaged. We can't target any of the creatures damaged with spell strike with the ray. Make a spell attack roll against the new target's AC at the same map as the strike. So yeah, this has the attack trait, and it's like, oh no, we're gonna take a minus five, except that we don't. On a hit, the target of the ray takes 1d4 damage per spell level of the same type of energy that the spell deals. If you cast the spell in your spell strike from a spell slot, the damage from Cascading Ray increases to d8s, letting the vulnerability to elements bounce around, letting extra damage bounce around without the map penalty. Bonkers. Next up, it's Arcane Shroud. Once per turn, if your most recent action was to cast a spell from a spell slot or make a spell strike with a spell from a spell slot, depending on the school of spell cast, the spell has a powerful after effect. You go into Arcane Cascade for one, and they're subject to an additional after effect spell depending on the school of your most recent spell. This lasts until the end of your next turn or its normal duration, whichever is longer. Which means if you cast an abjuration spell from your spell slots, you casually get a stone skin, conjuration gets blink, divination gets see invisibility, enchantment gets heroism, evocation probably most likely gonna happen for us, and magi in general, a free fire shield, or 10 rounds of if they hit you, they take an owie. Illusion gets invisibility, but it cuts after a hostile action. Necromancy gets False Life, and Transmutation gets Fleet Step. Once per turn, in a very long knockdown drag out combat, when your stone skin is running out, you can just re-up that stone skin. Imagine a world where you can cast Mage Armor and get a stone skin off it, off a first level spell slot. Pardon me while I go find a GM for second edition. Next, for our third focus point, and because haste real good, we'll take hasted assault. One action for a minute, we get an extra action only to strike. And then at 18th, versatile spell strike. Once during daily prep, you can use a spell slot to hold that infinite potential from the realm of possibilities rather than using it to prepare a spell. When we spell strike, we can expend the special spell slot to prep and cast any spell from our spell book at two levels lower than the slot's level. Versatility is really good. You never know what you're gonna see. You never know at the end of the game what the GM's gonna pull out of their pocket. This is value. Then at 20th, if you got this far, why not? Let's be permanently quickened using our extra action only to strike or to recharge our spell strike. For our archetype feats, these could probably get flipped back and forth. If you would rather have more spell slots than defensive power, flip these two around but our two archetypes today will be the wizard but first the bastion dedication we'll grab reactive shield or reaction if we have a shield and we get hit we can raise our shield maybe turning it into a miss then disarming block as a free action when you shield block a melee strike you can try to disarm i guess closing the book on the sword and then yeah, and pulling it away and the weapon flies away or whatever next we'll take shielded stride while you have your shield raised you can stride to move half your speed without triggering reactions am i in love with this no but we need to take another feat 
in order to get out of this archetype, so here we are. Then we'll grab the wizard dedication, basic wizard spellcasting, right behind it. Essentially just to fill that spellbook up as fast as we can with more spells to cast in a given day. Organize as you see fit, since our arcane spell attack roll should go off the Magus side. This is just extra gas in the tank. We will next take quick shield block for an extra reaction at the start of our turn, which we can use only to interpose a book between ourselves and the, what's an on CR creature? Dragon, certainly. And then destructive block. When we shield block, we can reduce the damage to ourselves by double our shield's hardness. But if we do, the shield takes double the normal amount of damage it would have taken before applying hardness. This doesn't work with indestructible shields. It does for all the other magic shields with the way too much value and i suppose there's nothing stopping you from getting an adamantine bound book right right i don't know that's weird i've never had to ask this question before these are the things that tui does to me easy peasy the rest of the way it's expert wizard spell casting master wizard spell casting and arcane breath for again more gas in that gas tank Skill feats, you'll know better than me how many buildings you're jumping out of. I guess athletics is a thing we want and probably arcana. That will depend on how many things you're tripping, disarming, or otherwise needing to recognize the spell casting of. For the ancestry feats, nimble hoofs is first to increase our speed by five feet. Then an incredibly hilarious bit of hobgoblin shenanigans, runt sage, to grab a free first level goblin ancestry feat and to be adopted by them. I have to say... There's probably a really good Sparkling Targe build that doesn't Arcane Cascade so much as it, like, ever stands stances and then spell strikes you with a book after using fire spells and burn it, thinking that words are bad. Look what they do. They set people on fire. Reading is bad. Kids don't do it. This allows our spells and alchemical items, mostly spells, that deal fire damage to gain a status bonus to that damage equal to half the spell's level or one quarter the item level. You also gain a plus one status bonus to any persistent fire damage. More damage, more pain, more owie when we need to stab things and set them on fire. Next, it's Cantorian Rejuvenation. For two actions, you get a bunch of HP and some temp HP. Almost makes you feel like you're an inexorable Iron Magus. Just snap your fingers, get a bunch back. To offset the fact that we don't have any real great ways to heal ourselves outside of like Vampiric Touch in our spell list. Then we'll take Can't Fall here. If somebody drops to zero HP but isn't killed, they don't fall unconscious, they remain at one hit point. They gain temp HP equal to your level that lasts for long enough for them to cry to the cleric, giving them orc ferocity, but slightly better. Then lastly, Cantorian Restoration. Because why not once per day if a living creature within 60 feet would die? Why not Breath of Life them except they get 68 plus your con mod back? Sure, why even question that? That's great, cool, cool. Thanks, wizard that experimented on goblins and made us and something about that magic is now in us and prevents death. Good. Anyway, for the general feats, armor proficiency first. Because we want to get hit but don't have a lot of decks, we'll want to wear the most iron we possibly can. Then toughness, die hard so you are tough and don't die. Then incredible initiative and Kenny Acumen for our reflex save. For our key magic items, did you know there are apex items other than the big six now? Titan's Grasp, why not? We'll get a plus two to our strength. I think at the end of the game we'll want that more than our con. Doubly so when whatever we're stabbing people with gets a conducting rune. This gives our weapon the resonant weapon trait, except that when we conduct energy, it does 1d8 additional damage instead of 1. That is to say, free action, cast a spell that does energy damage, you channel the owie into the weapon, it does extra damage of that type till the start of your next turn, or 1d8 plus 1 damage if the weapon was a wish blade and already had this, with persistent damage on a crit. Dare I say it, I guess we need an adamantine or eventually orichalcum bound book. Wild, I'm not touching that. I'm gonna let the GMs figure out how they want to let you what even. But since we don't get the abilities of specific shields inside the thing, the sturdy shield should be more than enough to just put the hardness of the shield on the back of your book. My brain hurts. Spells! Spells! Magic! Let's do that! So a lot of these spells got talked about in an earlier video. If you missed it, follow this card right up here. Fire is the name of the game this time. Scorching Ray, Fireball, if you can figure out how to do that without cooking yourself and your friends. Burning Hands eventually boil blood. It's where we get our status bonuses. They do damage. 
the Magi's bread and butter, as well as Gouging Claw, kind of a standby because it heightens so goddamn well. Blazing Dive, fly 15 feet up in the air when we really need to move 60 feet, but also hurt people a lot. This will help us stay mobile. So far as buffs and things go, True Strike, really huge for everybody. One action, get advantage when you need to close out the combat, especially with the Spell Strike, you could then turn into a critical hit. Shattering Gem to absorb a little bit of damage before your shield has to absorb a little bit of damage and also put damage on them if this thing should happen to explode. Probably a lot better in low level play, but a lot of things are. Mirror Image for that extra, oh my god, you swing with too much of an attack bonus, I have to block in another way. Mirror's Misfortune for a big debuff and a stall card. Warding Aggression, which appears under our fancy subclass spells for two actions. Make a melee strike with a weapon or unarmed attack in addition to the normal effects of the strike. On a success, it's a plus two status bonus to AC against whoever we just hit up to the spell's duration of one minute. Critical success, it's a plus three for a round, then a plus two for the minute. Failure, it's a plus one. Critical failure, nothing. More AC, more good. Then lastly, Flame Wisp. A fun two action buff spell. Every time you hit a creature with a strike, you do 1d4 fire damage. When we cast a Produce Flame or a Burning Hands or a Boil Blood or whatever the heck, while we have less than three of these for a minute, it's just another damage dot to tick up. And yeah. This build can do a lot of things. It goes all over the place, and that's one of the reasons I like it so much. It's not quite the 3.5 Abjurant Champion, but the 3.5 Abjurant Champion didn't have weird block with a book flavor, so that is what that is, I guess. Having the ability to buff your own AC, debuff the opponent's ability to hit you while also being a damage powerhouse is a lot of things rolled into one convenient shell. Which again, means that this build could be the fifth PC in basically any party. A jack of all trades and a master of most. What do y'all think? What do your magi look like in 2e? Let me know down in the comments. I'll probably be building magi for a while. I see you, summoner, but I liked you before. This one's new and shiny, and I gotta play with that new hotness. Like I said before, we're gonna do a rogue archetype into Magus for too much damage next week. Until then, my friends, we'll see you next time.